actually turned out to be the best thing that I could have done. So sometimes in our lives we come across difficulties and we think that there's no way that, that those, that's going to be a good thing for you. But my mother, she got lost one day and she's looking for a school and she happened on the wrong school, but this, there was a young, small little woman there who had trained uh, in Washington. And she said, okay, I'll bring your daughter here and I'll see what I can do. And she ended up having to retrain me from the beginning because I had refused to go to school. I had to taught myself uh, straight home school, home study, online, and sort of working and using YouTube to sort of teach myself. And uh, this woman, she worked from the ground up and changed my style from the Balanchine style to the Russian style. And that's when I started to push. And um, in the end of that year, I moved to Kirov Academy uh, of ballet training. So you know, it's a full time uh, dance, live, and study program in Washington, D.C. And this is where I sort of really committed to, to dance. And it's so important if you want to be a professional dancer, if you want to pursue um, dance in some way, not uh, in college, it's important that you start training seriously uh, with, when you're your age. So I, I really would like to encourage each and every one of you to work as hard as you can, because the more you invest yourself now, the easier it will be later. So I studied there for two years, and I, I wanted more of a challenge. And I went to go visit my grandmother in New York, and in New York, there was a master class. And in the master class, was a teacher from the culture school. And she said to me afterwards, um, are you interested in studying with us in Moscow? And to me, where I had been told all my life, you have no turnout, you have no facility, you are not coordinated, you can't earn combinations. Here was this woman saying, you know, if, if you want to, you can come and study in Russia. And that just changed, changed my life. And I said to my parents, I said, all, all the other doors are closed. I, I want to move to Russia. And so at the age of 15, I got on a plane by myself and moved to the Bolshevik Academy. And in the summer intensive, uh, my teacher, who ended up being my teacher during the full um, program, had agreed with the director to invite me to the Russian full-time program, which at the Bolshevik Academy in Moscow there um, is a program for international students. Which, which differs from what the Russian uh, students do. And all of a sudden, I was thrust into a program where I did not speak the language whatsoever. I didn't read Russian. And I had to be part of this class where I had no idea what the teacher was saying. And it was like there was a glass wall in front of me. She was saying, yelling something at me. And I, I don't understand. I don't understand. <laughs> and she said through a translator, probably a week through the the first week of school, she said, you know, Joy, if you want to be in my class, uh, within two months time, if you don't learn Russian, I'm going to kick you off. That doesn't mean I don't believe in you, that I don't think that you have what it takes, but you have to prove that I'm making the right bet on you. And in two months time, I was able to understand Russian. I woke up every day at 5 a.m. I was sitting in the splits and trying to learn my Russian alphabet and just really going to bed with tears in my eyes because I couldn't understand what anybody was saying. Um, I think the key to that is really if you um, are motivated or something and you truly desire and you work hard at it and you look at ways to solve problems from a different angle. So for me, I, it just wasn't making sense the language. I just couldn't understand it. And my friend, he, he in Russian, he took the books, he took the pencil, and he put it down and said, this is not how you're going to learn the language. Just talk with me. Just spend time with me, and you're going to learn it. And I learned it through just speaking with my friends and my colleagues and, and really trying to, to listen. So make sure that when you are in an unfamiliar place, that you don't stick to your comfort zone. Make sure to, to go out and, and really reach for, for maybe something that might seem uncomfortable to you, because that will expand your horizons. So after, um, after sort of the first part of that really hard year, we uh, had a performance, a graduation performance in Bolsha, and I was chosen to dance a solo, which was really, it was a big, a big honor for my teacher, and it sort of, sort of uh, made me stand out from the rest of the other girls, and, and that sort of launched me into um, being really pushed, and so I went from being the bottom of my class to the top of my class, and 
at age 17, I danced a principal role. Um, one of the first Americans to dance a principal role in school, um, at least in Left Mulberry. So I got to dance Left Mulberry at age 17 with the Bolshoi Valley. And I can tell you that moment before before the performance started, you know, she has to walk outside the, the um, house, the little house that is on the stage. I didn't want to open the door. <laughs> I just didn't want to go out on stage. And sometimes a little push um, and doing something a little bit scary, and it's worth it because that was the moment that launched my career. And, and I was so happy to graduate um, as the lead dancer and the top girl in my class and was invited to dance. Um, as an invited soloist. So I got to dance there for two years, which was an incredible experience. And it taught me a lot about um, morals. And I think that each one of you guys, um, you have to decide what kind of person are you and what you're going to bring into your dancing. Because here you have, you've studied so hard, you've created a body, you've put in the hours to become a machine. Now comes the question, who am I? What do I stand for? And, and what do I believe in? And I feel like each and every one of you should have those answers to those questions. They don't come easy, but look for them. Because the clarity of your dancing will show up on stage. Because at the end of the day, um, you have to go home at night and be able to put your head up on the pillow and say, I worked honestly, and I am who I am. So after two years of the bullshit, after um, saying no to things that maybe would have helped me launch my career, I actually was invited to join the Carnegie Valley. And at age um, 18, I got it. At age 19, I left the company. And I spent sort of six months um, just sort of in between, sort of didn't know if the company was going to accept me or not. It was very trial basis. And they gave me uh, a role to dance the lead in that cracker. Once again, it was the same fear that I had of you know, moving to Russia all by myself. Are they going to accept me? Are they going to judge me? It's the whole, the Russian public loves value so much. It's like, uh, it's like our pop stars, you know, Taylor Swift, these kinds of people. So you have a whole bunch of people coming to your performance rooting for you to fail. And once again, I do want to leave the wings. And um, after that performance, I was probably to principal at the age of 18, which was a huge, um, huge amount of responsibility because here I am just sort of out of school and just sort of after a bad experience in a company and they're handing me um, the responsibility of being a principal dancer because uh, in a ballet company you have a quarter ballet soloist and a principal and a principal dancer uh, has to lead the company but you have to know and have respect for the, all the other parts of the company so the quarter ballet so important that they have to work, move and work as one. They cannot do one that stands out. And those are important skills. As a soloist, you have to be able to balance uh, quarter body work and the roles at the same time. So you're really having to work on time management. And as a principal dancer, you have to be able to bring an idea and bring emotion to the audience. And there's that's a whole other thing of work. So uh, I'm really grateful because I think one of the things I've been lucky with my whole life is, is having um, tutors and teachers that I look up to. There is not one moment where you can say, look, I've arrived, I know what I'm doing. Because it's so important to find someone that you honor and that you can learn from. So I've got a great tutor who she trains me every day, same as you, same exercises, various tongues, uh, center exercises, point, and then do our variations. So it's so important that you go back to the basics and you uh, really put an emphasis on trying to do things cleanly, precisely, and honestly. There are no cheats and there is no fast road to success. Life is hard and we have to be uh, ready to accept the challenge that life gives us. There is not going to be a moment of this is easy. So with that in mind, it's important to know when the moments of success are, and those moments are performance. So enjoy uh, each moment of performance and try to give emotion 
to the audience and enjoy yourself on stage. Um, so that's sort of my story in a nutshell. I'm now um, with my third uh, third season of the Carlet. I'm going back and I have a big debut in uh, Swan Lake in October. So uh, if any of you guys follow me on, on social media, on Instagram or YouTube, you'll get to see sort of the preparation process for that. And I invite you to become part of the Project Green community. So uh, the Project Green is an idea that it's so awesome. I get to be here in Singapore and talk to amazing girls and boys who want to study ballet. I was just in Los Angeles and I got to speak to girls and boys who wanted to study ballet. So what I want to do is invite all um, people who love dance and invite them to join in on the forum and, and be able to ask questions and get the tools that they need to uh, pursue a um, life in dance. So I invite you to join that. And I am ready for your questions. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> So you know everything. 
it's considered small for Russia, it's about 100 dancers. Um, so even if you are a principal dancer, you can be dancing core ballet one night. So this is how you have to be prepared. So I tend to sort of have rehearsals going the whole day. Um, if there's a show, in the evening, if it's a show day, then we have a full run through of the show um, before we perform. So that's probably from about uh, one to four or five, and then we have the show from seven to eleven, and I get home at twelve. Uh, if it's not performance day, then I finish my day probably around five. Sometimes I go and I uh, have more meetings, or I uh, go to do exercise with my friends, regardless. Um, and I get home in the evening and I uh, do business and I edit the vlogs <laughs> and I put it up on YouTube. So, um, yeah, that's that's a typical day. Mm -hmm. Yes? Hi, I'm not a Yes, I think it's like, so that's a really uh, hard topic for a lot of us. I know there's a lot of pressure, especially on girls, um, to be thin. And I want to be open and candid about my own experience um, with eating disorders because um, when there is such high pressure and you have a tendency to be perfectionist, food is, becomes something that is a control factor and it's how you measure your self worth. And it's, I think this is for each and every one of us. Um, I, growing up in ballet school, I did not have a, a, a great idea of who I was and I used food to control and I. Close to dying. I became very, very thin. It was around 42 kilograms, which is too thin. Um, and I just, I, I started with anorexia and bulimia. So uh, when you are so deep in that hole of I just want to be thin, um, you are scared of eating. And you have to make a decision to decide, do you want to be a strong dancer? Do you want to be a dancer who has something to say? Or do you just want to be something that looks pretty? Um, and it came to a point where I, I couldn't do what I, I had been chosen to come to Russia for, which was technique and was jumps and, and expression, because I was just too tired and too weak because I wasn't feeding myself. So it is still a struggle to this day. I still struggle with, with um, thinking that maybe I'm not the thinnest or I, you know, I have to be on a diet and things like that. But I've been very lucky. My family loves me and they worked very hard with me. And uh, because of the, the food bar that I make, the Prima bar, um, I was able to start dressing food again. And that it's, it's a small uh, 10 gram protein uh, meal bar that uh, we have 10 grams, 20 grams, and 30 grams. And 30 grams is like a full meal replacement. But I have a prima bar in the morning with my coffee and water. Um, and I take supplements, so I've been very careful about um, always having the right amount of vitamins and calcium because dance is very hard on, on your body. So it's important to make sure that you're taking um, a supplements or getting all the, the things that you need in your diet to go on with that. And in Russia, I have, um, we have soup that's very popular, so I have nice soup, nice protein, and, um, and I use those premium bars when I'm in the, in the theater because it's hard to, to get access to hot food because I'm there. Um, but on a normal day, like, I just had chicken rice for lunch, you know? <laughs> and I always like to have a nice dinner. So I, I definitely try to shoot for around 1,500 to 2,500 calories daily, which is okay. It's okay. <laughs> It's totally fine because you are young, you're growing, and you're dancing daily. Do not limit your intake because you want to be thinner. Work with a nutritionist and, and uh, try to eat more protein rather than restricting calories because you are beautiful and you're worthy and you're strong and you must honor your body. Any other questions? That's a really good question. Yes, that like, like anything in life is extremely competitive. My advice to you is not be the 
strongest or be the, the, be the highest laid in the room. Those are all great things that goes without being said. But be you. Be brave. Be confident. Believe in yourself. Because I can tell you, it was just at the Asian Grand Prix, how many dancers came out on that stage, scared of the stage. This is your moment to shine. When you are on, sh on stage, nobody can touch you. It's your free space. It's your time to shine. Use it. Don't be afraid of making a mistake or what other people think. Use your time to say something and just enjoy it. And you will stand out because you will be confident, you won't be wobbly. Um, and listen to the music and find a connection to the music. And that will give you the confidence to be yourself. So that's my advice to you. You will stick out, I promise you. <laughs> When you get tired, how do you get to? Uh, when I get tired, uh, I think it's, it's important to balance rest um, with work. And uh, I try to be, uh, first of all, I try to increase my stamina. If I know if I notice that I'm, I'm struggling in class, I try to increase more cardio so that I'm able to keep up physically with the demands of, uh, of my job. So for example, if I'm doing a full length diet, I don't have to be increasing my, um, my cardio, cardiovascular um, output. So I recommend working on cardio, but I also recommend getting a good diet, good sleep, and making sure that you have time in the day to rest and put your feet up. Um, recovery, recovery, recovery. Does that answer your question? Uh, if you're tired in class, if you need, like, it, it's hard for you to breathe, um, the breathing technique that I used, like to use in class is in through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your mouth, out through your nose. But especially during jumps. And, and, and this kind of, like, if you, if you really concentrate on doing that 10 times, you'll find that it's already easier to do the next competition. <laughs>
you have to understand that everyone has an idea of what they want. And you can't be too upset if, if you aren't what they want. Because if you force yourself to be what they want, but that's not who you are, then you're going to be unhappy. So through rejections, and through no's, and through slam doors in your face, um, I promise you, you will find your place, even if it seems like you won't. And you'll learn so much more about yourself um, through the hard times. And then when there are those fun times, or like, I get to see men in Singapore and see a country that I've wanted to see my whole entire life just because I said yes to an email. Yeah. And, and so be open to possibilities that you'll, you can never expect. And um, don't be afraid to fail because the sweet moments of success are that much sweeter after the hard times. Yeah, please, you can 
flash the second time. Yes? Yes. Yes. There's an extreme difference between the Russian style and the Balanchine style. Um, and this is something we have to be careful about when we're training, because the Balanchine style is, uh, is, is an aesthetic choice. And the Balanchine style uh, is an interpretation of what Mr. Balanchine, who was Russian, he is Georgian, but trained in the Russian school, came to the United States. So he was trying to teach dancers in the United States who had never um, danced style before. They hadn't even seen it. They've seen the, the Diablo company. So American dancers uh, had different issues. So for example, in the Russian technique, our, um, our hands are held like this, and it's a continuation of the line in the Russian technique. It's more of a C hand. Um, and it's become sort of distorted over the years. Uh, but he did that in order to engage so that there wouldn't be a droopy elbow. And for example, their board position is, is extended, whereas the Russian position is a nice, uh, smaller position. So I would say that the Russian, uh, that there's not one good or bad, per se, but I do say that if you have been trained in the Balanchine style, it will be very difficult, almost, and dare I say impossible, to dance a classical ballet to the world standard. The world standard is based off of an aesthetic which is accepted worldwide because of the fact that most classical ballets were preserved impeccably in the Russian tradition. So the Russian or the, the French or the, the English style, they, these are the building blocks. Um, this is your foundation. After you get your foundation, and you say, Russian, Pajalska, please, go get whatever you want. You want balance style, put that on. You want to do crack contemporary, you can do it. If you don't have a clean and, and well, uh, well-built base or foundation, you cannot build on top of it. So be very mindful about taking stylistic things when your base is not quite built. It's really hard to pick um, my favorite experience, but I think I'll never, ever, ever forget um, graduating on the Bolshevik stage, on a historic stage, and dancing the lead Pahina um, there. Uh, that was really special. And dancing on, in my home theater in Kremlin was really amazing. But I have to say, through leaving the Bolshevik, it made me realize that no matter what stage, large or small, uh, new or old, um, as long as I'm on stage and getting to dance for people, those are the experiences I cherish. So getting to dance in Barcelona or Madrid or here in Hong Kong and, and hopefully one day in Singapore, those to me mean more than, than like a huge theater with a big name. If there are people who are waiting for me to to see me dance, knowing that I gave them, uh, them true emotion, I would be much happier than if some big, huge critic gave me a nice review in, in a shiny opera house. So maybe I'm different than most dancers, but that is what makes me happy. In the, the Bolshevik school, we did we we studied contemporary uh, Russian traditional dance, national dances. So that's like Hungarian, Azerbaijan, Asian. Uh, there's all these different or dances all over the world. Um, I got to do Indian dance. Um, I do contemporary on a regular basis because you have to um, as a dancer going forward. Um, I love jazz. <laughs> I love to watch that in ballroom dancers, and hip hop is really fun. <laughs> it's really awkward doing it, but I like it. <laughs> so, I just like, um, the two pieces, because you have to leave, 
Okay, let's we'll go to another class. This is your last shot to ask the question. Uh, please, uh, please ask the question. Um, I'm asking for your last friend. What white shoe friend do you use? <laughs> <laughs> I see you crying inside my face. Don't be embarrassed. I use Gary Mendes, but um, Gary makes a special shoe just for me. Um, and as a professional dancer, or as a dancer who is aspiring to be a professional dancer, I recommend um, contacting your shoe maker, your shoe brand, and, and getting a shoe custom fit for yourself. Um, and even with the Gainer Minden shoe that they make for me, I spend around five hours modifying and darning and sewing them so that they look exactly how I want them. So I would definitely recommend looking into whether it's Krishko, Block, Sancha, um, uh, Gainer Minden, contact them and set up the shoe fitting um, to make a shoe custom made for yourself. And that goes for boys as well. My partner is so, so particular about the shoes that he wears. And if he doesn't like how they're made, he'll just throw them out. So there is room in ballet to see this. Boys, get ready. <laughs>
I'd like to be able to offer less privileged uh, children opportunity uh, because it's so hard to become a dancer these days if you don't have the finances for paying for point shoes, for paying for private tuition, for paying for flights, paying for auditions, paying for this and that. It just seems like there's pay, 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 and no, uh, nobody really wins. And so that's something that I'm very passionate about, and I want to be able to give um, dancers who don't have maybe the luxuries that a lot of some of us have. Um, personally, growing up in a family that with so many children, there really wasn't an option to stay in the United States to train where it costs around forty thousand dollars average to study ballet, if not more. Um, and in order to be a professional dancer, the girls that I know who are now have technically made it, their parents are spending around $100,000 a year, and they are still supported by their parents. That is in no way someone that maybe who has an extreme amount of talent from Malaysia or from, um, from Brazil or from the heartlands of Russia um, has. So if I could be able to create something that could give back um, to those dancers and be able to create uh, a draw for, um, for dancers and a desire to go and see dance, and how do we do that? We do that by promoting dancers and classical musicians and opera singers as uh, figures in society. So instead of looking up to somebody who's half dressed, to somebody who is working eight hours in the studio every day. So that means we have to change our popular culture, and that starts with you. So I want to conclude this all by saying thank you so much, and the future is in your arms. So you decide who you um, put as your, as your inspiration and as your idols, and I ask you to choose wisely and to go for it. Because the more you we have, the better our world is. So thank you so much for studying this. I encourage you.